in the last unit, we're going to be talking about end to end learning algorithms that not only learn the matching cost, but directly take entire images as input and using a deep neural network directly output disparity maps. And this was something that was really only possible with increasing compute in particular annotated data sets that could be used for training these models because these models now require much more uh, label training data compared to the models that just compute um, or try to learn good models for uh, matching local patches. The first model in this context that basically spurred an entire field is called DISPNET. It was the first end-to-end -end trained deep neural network for stereo. The input, uh, it's very similar to the FlowNet model, is a pair of images, left-right images, we have some convolutions, downsampling, and we have some skip connections. So it's a, new, a unit architecture. We use skip connections to try to retain uh, fine details. And then we have this up convolution uh, in order to increase resolution again. So we have a contracting and an expanding part. And in the end, we obtain directly, we directly predict or regress a disparity map using this. And this is trained end to end. There is no global optimization introduced in the end. Um, it's all trained from very large amounts of data. One thing that's uh, specific about this architecture is that, uh, and that has also been used then by follow-up works, is that after a few convolution and uh, pooling layers, when ha having reached already a relatively small resolution, there is already some idea about stereo matching incorporated here by having a correlation layer that does something similar to the correlation that's happening also in block matching, but now on this feature level. So we're having, if you will, a Siamese network here, and then we're doing this correlation layer here that tries to now combine these two. And then from there on, we have just a single branch and not two branches anymore. So this is incorporating some of these basic ideas um, of traditional stereo matching. Turns out that actually even without this correlation layer, just combining, concatenating these features here, we can already get good results, but um, this improves results slightly. In order to train this model, the authors used a multi-scale loss. Um, uh, so the loss was not only applied, the loss that measures um, the discrepancy between the predicted disparity and the ground truth disparity was not only applied at the last layer, but it was also applied for downscaled versions of the ground truth at intermediate layers. And uh, another thing that they did in order to make this actually work is a curriculum learning strategy where the model, and that turned out to be very important in order to not overfit, was first trained on easy examples, like very simple scenes that are easy to match and smaller resolutions. And then later the difficulty of the data sets was increased until the target data set difficulty had been reached. And that's a strategy that is still frequently used in particular in the context of training deep uh, neural networks for stereo estimation and optical flow estimation. Another important thing is data sets. Creating data sets of stereo imagery with ground truth is really hard. In Kitty, we used a LiDAR scanner, but then the data set was very, first of all, it had to be manually created. So it created a lot of work uh, in order to remove outliers and create it. And then second, it's uh, very specific to the self-driving scenario. Now, if you wanna go broader, you wanna have also stereo images from more general scenes. And for those, it's often very hard to get the ground truth displacements because there's not really a good sensor that can measure that. And what was done in this paper and what's particularly surprising to everybody at the time um, that this works is that a uh, very large synthetic data sets have been created for which the annotations are cheap to obtain because if we render data, 3D assets, then uh, we get the depth for free. We can just render the depth layer using a rendering engine. But what was surprising is that very um, uh, data sets that the data sets that were created were very dissimilar 
from the target data sets that were used for testing and for fine tuning and testing the model. Uh, so on the target data sets like Kitty, the model was then the pre-trained model on these data sets was fine tuned for a, a few more epochs, but only a few more epochs because these annotated real data sets are small and the synthetic data sets, um, these artificial data sets are large. But despite this discrepancy between the appearance of these data sets in the, for example, Kitty data set, the performance on the target data sets was reasonably good. And the reason for this is that these models are able to generalize well. These matching problems are able to generalize reasonably well. So here in this case, this is a data set called Flying Things, where just random assets have been downloaded from the internet. You can see there is flying cars and flying chairs, and they were just put on top of random backgrounds from which then the images and also the ground truth was generated. A very chaotic data set, but it provides a lot of difficulties to the stereo matching problem. As you can see, there's a lot of depth discontinuities. And so the model becomes a generic depth estimator that generalizes comparably well if it's fine-tuned on the target data set later on. And another data set that was used was the Monka data set, which is a CGI um, movie with free assets. And here is a result of DiskNet applied on the Kitty data set. You can see the resulting disparity maps are, are smooth and they are of high quality. A Follow-up work is called GCNet that led to even better performance than DiskNet by utilizing a very simple idea. What has been done differently in this model while also using a shared 2D convolutional encoder was that now uh, a, this um, uh, the cost volume that was created um, by a correlation and in this case, both for the left and for the right image as reference image, was then filtered with a 3D filter that could then adapt to this correlation volume and pick up features in that volume. So the difference to this model here, while also having a correlation layer, is that here, this is still 2D convolutions. And here, from this layer on, we have 3D convolutions and also 3D deconvolutions in order to increase the spatial resolution. So the key idea is to calculate the disparity cost volume, similar to traditional methods, and then apply 3D convolutions on that volume. And this leads to slightly better performance, but has larger implications for the memory. It's very memory intensive. So very small mini batch sizes could be used here because these 3D volumes are very memory intensive and these 3D convolutions are more memory intensive than 2D convolutions. One thing that was also done here was that the disparity estimation problem wasn't tasked uh, to be as in the disparate case here as a regression problem, um, but instead as a problem where now, because we have these 3D convolutions on that volume, we can predict a um, matching cost also for each disparity hypothesis, right? So we can have now for each, at each location, at each pixel, U, V, or X, Y in the image, and at each disparity level, now we can uh, predict for each disparity level at each pixel a matching cost. So we don't have to rely on regression. And then these matching costs, they have to be combined, of course, somehow. And what they did in this paper is simply to take the expectation. So at each pixel, this is per pixel, we compute the expectation over the disparity, which is basically computed by taking the sum over all disparities, hypotheses at that pixel, computing the probability for that disparity, which is the negative cost turned into a probability by computing a softmax along the entire vector of disparities. Remember the softmax um, outputs a, probability, a discrete probability distribution so the scores here, this negative cost or scores are turned into a discrete probability distribution. And this is then multiplied with the disparity. So we are trying to 
minimize, we're, we're computing the, the estimated disparity is the expected disparity and we're trying to minimize the discrepancy between the expected disparate, uh, disparity from that cost volume and the ground roof disparity. Now, um, as a final example that I want to show you, while there's many more examples that many more works that have been done in that area is uh, so-called stereo mixture density networks. That's uh, a rather recent work that we did in our group um, at CVPR 2021. And the idea of stereo mixture density networks is now to scale these models. All of these models are quite memory hungry and they can be applied to very large image resolution. And one particular problem of these models is also that if we use uh, these models, then because of the intrinsic smoothness properties of deep neural networks, we get these smearing artifacts. You can see that the borders are not very sharp. And if we would project such a disparity map into 3D space, we would see um, uh, that there's a bleeding at the edges of objects. And this is illustrated here. So this is a standard, um, a state-of-the-art standard model called HSM that produces at the dispar disparity discontinuities such bleeding artifacts, flying pixels, because of the smoothness uh, properties of uh, neural network-based regression, basically. And so these are the results of the SMD nets, the stereo mixture density networks that predict sharper boundaries and also at much higher spatial resolution. And how is this done? Well, the first innovation here is um, that instead of predicting just a single or regressing a single disparity value, we're predicting a multimodal distribution over disparity values. And the advantage of this is that with this, we can model much sharper disparity discontinuities. On the left, we see as an example, a classical deep network for stereo regression that suffers from the smoothness bias and hence continuously interpolate object boundaries. So we see the green in green, the true disparity, but the best this model can do is to predict these black dots here, which you can see are smoothly transitioning from the background to the foreground. On the y-axis, we have the disparity. And here on the right, we have um, this mixture density network that predicts a mixture distribution. So at each uh, x location here, this is the image uh, column for a particular image row. We predict a uh, bimodal distribution in this case over the disparity values. And so that distribution can, can basically model both of these modes. And if we then take as the final disparity value, the value that maximizes this distribution, then we can model a sharp transition here because at some even for these two dis these distributions are continuously transitioning you can see that they're this transition of this peak here becoming weaker and this peak here becoming stronger is continuous we obtain a sharp discontinuity and this models is, is a much better model for uh, given a cnn as a predictor is a much better model for disparity maps and the other innovation we did here is that we, in, on top of a standard stereo backbone, and we experimented with various backbones, what we did is we didn't directly predict at a fixed resolution the output uh, disparity or the parameters of this mixture model, but we have an additional hat, so-called SMD hat, that queries using an MLP at an arbitrary continuous location in the image domain the feature values using interpolation, using bilinear interpolation, and then passes these bilinearly interpolated features predicted by the backbone through this MLP in order to predict the parameters of this mixture distribution, in this case, a bimodal Laplacian mixture. And this really enables training and inference at arbitrary spatial resolution. So despite the input images might uh, be of fixed resolution, let's say HD images, we can predict at much higher resolution outputs. So here's an example of this. On the bottom, we see an example of a classical state-of-the-art stereo, deep stereo matching network. This is an output, of course, for a test image that wasn't part of the training set. We can see that the resolution, the output resolution, the maximal output resolution that can be achieved here is 0 0.5 megapixels. So we get a pixelated result 
and we also see this smearing this bleeding uh, at the boundaries where we get disparity values that are actually incorrect while using the combination of this bimodal mixture model and this uh, SMD hat that allows for querying and also training a model at arbitrary spatial precision, we don't get these bleeding artifacts. And also at the same time, we can query the output disparity map at much higher resolution, like 128 megapixels as in this example here. That's all for today.